My most vivid memory of the late 90s was the Clinton Lewinsky scandal. Not because of the scandal itself, but because of the coverage of it. I remember my parents were pissed off at Clinton and kept calling him the deadbeat president. I couldn't watch any TV because they had the news running non-stop. We lived in Maryland, and my dad knew somebody who knew President Clinton personally. So they were getting details about what was going on behind the scenes. To clarify, my dad worked for the Department of Defense at the time, and Clinton being removed from office would have resulted in some kind of power shift, and his direct superior being promoted. What did I care? I was just a kid. I just wanted to watch Rocco's Modern Life. I remember my parents inviting over about 10 people, and while they had loud conversations downstairs as the TV was playing, I was up in my room, being a bitter kid. My parents wouldn't let me take the smaller black and white TV out of the closet. They couldn't get it to tune into the channel I wanted to watch anyway. I was sitting in my bed, listening to one of my cassette tapes, trying to drown out the annoying serious adult conversation taking place downstairs. When I happened to glance out the window, down in the backyard, I saw a man I didn't recognize move across the yard quickly in the dark, avoiding the patches of light cast by the downstairs windows. I got out of bed and looked out my window at him. I remember that he was bald and very tall, taller than my dad. But I figured that he was just one of the guests that were visiting. Who cares about what he was doing in our backyard? I watched him more out of boredom than anything else. The man cautiously came closer to the house peering into the ground floor windows. I was about to go back over to my dresser and flip my cassette tape over, when the man tossed something about the size of a video cassette into the doghouse. Now, our dog, Jim and I, had just died a few weeks before. I didn't like this strange man touching the doghouse for any reason. So like the obnoxious kid I was, I walked out onto the landing and called out to my parents below. The tone of my voice left no doubt that I was unhappy, and wanted the situation resolved immediately. I remember the silence that followed lasted way longer for my liking. What man? My mother called back up to me. From down below, all became quiet. All I could hear was the TV. To this day, I have never seen my dad move so fast. He shot up the stairs, picked me up, and came back down. My mom and the other house guests followed. We all had to wait at the neighbor's house across the street while the police and the bomb squad came. I don't think I realized the severity of the situation until I was much older, but at the time I was more annoyed than afraid. I was asked to share everything that I saw, but the only way I could describe the man was saying that he looked like Captain Picard. I wasn't the best at descriptions. I don't remember most of what happened next. We eventually got to go back into our house. My dad died of blood poisoning in 2005, and my mom passed away of natural causes in 07. They never told me exactly what the package was, whether it was a bomb or a threat of any kind, but it was definitely something serious. The police would come back and show me pictures of possible suspects. I don't remember ever identifying the stranger in our backyard. I live in Vermont now, and I really have no ties to the people that my parents knew but I have a creepy story for the ages that always entertains at parties. Several decades ago, my grandfather used to have this crazy neighbor who lived on a ridge overlooking his home in central Missouri. The guy was an insane conspiracy nut who didn't allow electronics of any kind on his property and refused to recognize the local police department's authority over him. People in the neighborhood called him Tanner. I guess you could label him as what's called a sovereign citizen. The guy had an arsenal of various weapons, killed animals for meat, brewed his own booze, and grew his own vegetables. My grandpa lost track of how many times the police drove past his house to climb the ridge and confront him. There was once a standoff that lasted most of the day, where the guy wouldn't leave his house until the cops had to pull his front door off with a chain tied to a truck. He would spend brief periods of time in jail for disorderly conduct, hunting on other people's property, and resisting arrest, but he would always return home eventually. The cops warned my grandfather's family that the guy was not to be approached for any reason, and if there was ever a problem, just call them instead. They reported that Tanner set traps in his own lawn, and had shackles and chains in his back room. My grandfather only has one distinct memory of him. One winter, he was smoking on his back porch, 
when the crack of a rifle being fired way too close made him jump, and a short-tailed hawk fell out of the sky, bounced off the porch railing right next to him and landed on his lawn. My grandfather looked up in shock as the hawk thrashed on the ground. From the ridgeline above, he heard the man yell, Don't touch him! He's mine! My grandpa shouted back at Tanner that he would call the cops if he came down onto his property. He then went inside and locked the door. Where the real story starts is in the spring, sometime in the early 80s. A rust-colored panel van broke down on my grandfather's street, and the driver pulled off to the side and parked right in the dirt path that led up to Tanner's place, probably not even realizing that it was a driveway. A few hours later, there was a pounding on my grandfather's door. He found three very large men asking if he was the one who broke into their van and stole their stuff. My grandfather, not without a good reason, pointed them up the hill towards Tanner's place, and the three made their way up the dirt path. From here, I'm going to speak about what the police eventually reported to my grandfather. The three men kicked in Tanner's door when they arrived, and the first one through the door stepped into a bear trap. It was laid out on the floor in the dark hallway. Then Tanner, who had apparently been waiting for them outside in the bushes, hit the other two with bear mace and forced them down the hall into his back room, where he attempted to subdue them and chain them to the wall, but one escaped. Nearly blind, he stumbled into what the police described as a barbed-wired net that Tanner had set up near his back door. From down the ridge, my grandfather sat by his shed and waited to hear the commotion. But when he started hearing screams and gunshots, he called the police. When the police arrived, they found the front door wide open and several small traps set throughout the house, including an axe that was made to swing down from the ceiling. One of the men were found shackled in the back room with a knife shoved through his hand. The man in the net had been shot four times and was left to bleed out. Tanner was nowhere to be found. When my grandfather asked what happened to the third man, the police reported that there were only two found in the house. Both men survived and were taken to the hospital, but afterwards they were arrested for outstanding warrants. The police didn't specify, but they implied that they had been smuggling drugs or stolen goods in the van, and that's what Tanner had stolen from them. Tanner himself was never seen after that, though my grandfather did hear a report on the radio a few years later that a man matching his description was found dead in a ditch in Kentucky. I've always considered that to be one of the craziest home invasion stories I've ever heard, and to this day my family still jokes around about the missing bear trap man. Shortly after that happened, my grandfather moved across state to a different house, but he did return once to his old house just for a look, and he could have sworn that he noticed somebody looking down at him from the hill above. When I was a kid, my family moved into a house in the suburbs of Ottawa, Ontario. It was a pretty normal residential neighborhood with houses on each side of the street. There was a neighbor that stood out from the rest. When my dad went across the street to introduce himself, he immediately got a strange vibe. She barely spoke and wouldn't open the door more than a crack. She seemed very secluded and shy, and she didn't even give her name. So we ended up calling her Crazy Lady. One day I was playing outside with my brothers. We were having fun but there was this overwhelming feeling that somebody was watching us. I tried not to think about it too much, but suddenly I heard a knocking sound on a window from the house across the street. I look over at the crazy lady's house. She was standing in front of her window watching us playing in our driveway. We made eye contact for a moment, and I quickly looked away, wondering why she was just standing there watching us. I was also wondering how many times she had done this, and we just hadn't noticed. I went inside and told my parents, but they said not to worry about it. It seemed that every time we were outside, I noticed her standing in her front window. She never smiled or waved, just stared. The only time she would ever speak to us was when a ball or something else we were playing with rolled into her driveway and we had to go fetch it. She would come outside and almost immediately start yelling at us, telling us to get off her property. Fast forward about five years, and my neighbor finally disappears. It was as if, one night, she just up and left. No one in my family was sorry to see her go. But even when she left, that wasn't the end of it. One night not long after, we heard sirens outside of our house. The fire department and paramedics had all gathered outside the crazy lady's home. 
My mom went over to them and tried to explain that the house was empty, but they responded that they had received a call from a medical alert necklace at that address. We all went back to sleep, assuming something had gotten mixed up and they just ended up at the wrong address. Eventually, a new family moved into the house. We all went over to introduce ourselves, and we got to talking about the woman who used to live there. They seemed confused, and told us that they had owned that property for many years, and no one, at least according to them, was supposed to be living there. Eventually, through their oldest son, my family and I learned two things later on. Upon re-entering the house, there had been a single chair facing the window in front of the living room, and that no one could remember leaving it there. Second, down in the basement, there was a small room, more of a storage space really. It was locked from the inside, and the family couldn't access it. The parents never remembered it being locked or requiring a key. To the best of my knowledge, they never got access to the space. But I couldn't help but wonder, even years later, if the remains of that old woman were down there, behind that locked door. I have a faint memory of being involved in the Rodney King riots back in 1992. I was only seven at the time. We had originally been stacking empty beer cans in my friend's fenced-in backyard when the commotion started. We heard a lot of yelling and cursing and police sirens. Even a few loud pops, which I didn't understand at the time, were gunshots. We all wandered over to the chain link fence and watched the rioters up the street. They were shouting and breaking windows getting into fights with cops and other random pedestrians. I have no recollection as to who was babysitting us that day, but needless to say, they did a piss poor job. My friends and I actually left the enclosed yard and wandered out into the street to get a better look at the chaos, completely oblivious to the fact that what we were watching wasn't a show and one of those stray bullets could have easily killed us. We would watch two people fighting from a safe distance, then something else would catch our eye becoming more and more separated from the backyard. One of my friends witnessed a shop being looted and asked us if he wanted any candy. He was a bit older, maybe 11. He crossed the street and peered through the broken glass, apprehensive about going inside because of all the infuriated adults around breaking things. I eventually got separated from all my friends. Most of the memory is a blur. I remember at one point getting scared when I realized that I didn't recognize anything. I ran into an alley and crouched down to watch. I remember seeing a cop take a corner pretty hard and flipped a man over the hood of his patrol car. A group of other men rushed the car before the cops could get out and started banging on the windows. In the alley across from me, I saw three or four other men pouring gasoline into a dumpster and lighting it on fire. I remember finding that fascinating, seeing a fire burning in something other than a fireplace or a ring of stones. I watched the fire grow bigger and bigger, completely oblivious to the world around me. I wanted to look closer, but I was too scared about crossing the street because there were so many people running around. I remember one woman walked past me down the alley. She came up to me and kissed me on the forehead and said, God bless you child, get yourself home. Before I could even respond that I didn't know where home was, she was gone. She lit a cigarette and disappeared down the alley. I don't know how long I sat there, maybe only 20 minutes, maybe longer, but the dumpster fire was still raging, and I continued watching it. The next part stands out the clearest in my mind. A man in a green and white windbreaker turned the corner into the alley, saw me, and grabbed me by the shirt collar. He reeked of smoke, sweat, and gasoline. He might have been one of the men from before who started the fire, I'm not sure. He started dragging me across the road towards the dumpster fire. He was cursing and swearing at me, and I began to panic. I suddenly became afraid that he was going to toss me into the fire, as I could see the flames coming closer and closer. I wasn't sure if that's exactly where we were heading, or if we were just going in that direction. But I squealed and kicked in protest, until he put me into a headlock and cut off my air. When we got to the far side of the street, I could feel the heat of the fire on my face. Suddenly a bigger man grabbed the man holding me and threw him against the wall and punched him in the face. I remember staggering to the ground and watching in horror as the bigger man pressed my kidnapper's face to the side of the dumpster. The man screamed louder than I knew a human could scream. I remember the briefest smell of burning meat 
I then took off running down the sidewalk. After that, it's mostly just blurry. I remember tripping and falling, and another woman picking me up and telling me to go into the church and sit down. I must have sat there in the pews until someone recognized me and brought me home. I really don't remember the details. Remarkably, I was mostly unharmed, aside from a few scrape marks. One of my friends had to be rushed to the hospital after someone had thrown a TV out of a high window and some of the glass hit him in the face when the TV hit the sidewalk, but he turned out to be okay. I don't know if that bigger man was coming to save me or just had beef with the man who grabbed me, but I often wonder what happened to the man in the windbreaker. I wonder if that bigger guy killed him after pressing his face to the side of that scolding hot dumpster. Seeing fire calls that memory back. I could be watching a movie and see a bonfire in the background, and that scream will echo in my head. Considering what could have happened to me, I think I got off lucky. I live in a dirt cheap housing complex in Detroit. Last year I was in the process of moving in. I hadn't even been there two full days. It was about 11 at night, and the majority of the house was dark because I hadn't plugged in most of my lamps yet. I was upstairs in the smaller bedroom, hanging up some clothes, when I heard the front door open downstairs. The door was old and warped, and once it was fully shut, you really had to fight to force it open, twisting the knob as far as you could, and then putting your shoulder into it. It wasn't locked, mostly because I figured that there was no point. No one was going to bother trying to break into this old, decrepit place. I stood up and walked out into the hallway and looked down into the dark living room below. I heard someone rummaging around in the kitchen, where I had left my phone and laptop on the counter. Figuring that it was my friend who came back because she forgot something, I called out, Hey Patty, is that you? Silence from downstairs. Now, I consider myself to be a pretty tough person, but I can also be extremely reckless. I yelled out angrily and stormed down the stairs, Convinced that someone had wandered into my house to rob me, I grabbed an umbrella I left on the stairs, ready to wield it like a sword. There was no thought in my mind about what would happen if the intruder had a gun, or if there was more than one of them. When I turned the corner into the living room and looked into the kitchen, there was no one there. I stood still for a moment and just listened. The only light on the ground floor was coming from a single lamp that I had plugged in by the stairs. There was enough light to see that there was no one there. Deciding not to let my guard down, I took three careful steps forward, umbrella raised high, and turned my head to look at the far side of the kitchen where the pantry is. Right as I did, the pantry door swung open softly. It wasn't completely closed, so when it opened it barely made a whisper of a sound. The man who stepped out from behind looked me dead in the eye, and I nearly fell to my knees in terror. From beneath the man's hood, his face looked pasty and melted. His skin was stretched so thin across his skull, it looked like a layer of cellophane. His mouth was a sideways gash, and his nose was barely more than a lump protruding from just below his eyes. Both of his eyes were open so wide, they looked as big as light bulbs. I dropped my umbrella and took a step back. I was petrified convinced in that moment that it was some kind of demon, ready to drag me down to hell. The figure had my laptop and a container of cold turkey in his arm. In his other hand, he held an ice pick that was pointed at my face. He muttered in a slurred voice that he was leaving. And just like that, he power walked out of my living room and into the night. I fell to my knees on the kitchen floor and tried to catch my breath. The man hadn't been physically large or imposing, in fact he was shorter than I was, but his face had caught me so off guard that my insides turned to ice water. From outside I heard a car horn and the squeal of tires, and the sound of someone yelling. I crawled over to the door, intending just to slam it shut, but then I noticed the headlights of a car stopped in the road. The container of food was splattered all over the ground, and my laptop was right beside it. A man climbed out of the car and cried out for someone to call the cops that some idiot had run out in front of his car and he struck him. It took the police close to an hour to arrive 
and of course by that time, the intruder was gone. I was sitting on my front step wrapped in a blanket and smoking a cigarette when the cops came over, and I described the man's face as best I could, to which the cop asked, Like a burn victim? I nodded my head. He said he knew exactly who that was, and that they would look around for him and check the hospitals in case he was badly hurt. They said his name was Marvin, and that he had been trapped in a burning car when he was a kid, and now he was homeless, and mostly broke into cars looking for valuables to pawn. I didn't go out onto the street to collect my belongings. I felt awful, like I had just deprived a man of the only meal that he was likely to get that night. It crossed my mind that he had been trying to hide in the pantry, and that he was more scared of me than I was of him. I never found out what happened to him, but I do hope he's okay. When I was 17, I worked on my grandfather's horse ranch in Colorado. This was back in the late 80s, when throwing the football around and drinking were all there was to do when I wasn't cleaning out the barn or feeding the horses. At the time, both my father and my grandfather were well known throughout the community as being upstanding people, and it seemed as though everyone who encountered them in town was on a first name basis with them. As a result, that made me well known during social gatherings as well. I don't remember the exact date, but it was late November or early December of 88. I was horseback riding deep through the back woods with my cousin Roy. It was the furthest we had ever traveled back into our family's property and we were enjoying the sensation of exploring a new place. I was focusing mostly on the compass because I didn't want to get lost, but Roy was scanning the tree line for new landmarks and anything interesting worth investigating. I wasn't expecting him to find anything, so I nearly fell off my saddle when he pointed out what appeared to be an RV parked amongst the trees. We made our way towards it on the horses, and discovered it to be one of those old-fashioned truck RV campers that had its own power supply. It wasn't really parked on a dirt road or anything, it was more of an open avenue between the trees wide enough to fit through. I had no idea which direction the closest road was. My very first thought was that it had to be abandoned, but the closer we got, the more obvious it became that it was in pretty good shape. Almost new, I would say. I stepped down off of my horse and knocked on the door. I was curious to know if someone was living out here on our property and therefore trespassing, or if it belonged to the two dozen or so people my grandfather knew from town and most likely I would know them as well. After knocking several times, I tried the handle to discover that it was locked. Now the practical thing would have been to note our position and head back home and ask our family if they knew what it was. But we were teenagers and had no common sense. We wanted to explore further and went to the far side and discovered the window opposite the door was cracked. I pulled it halfway open and peered inside. The first thing that hit me was the smell. It was like a wave of burnt bacon mixed in with stale tobacco. Roy jokingly asked me if I found any bodies in there as I peered around. It was late in the morning and the sun was high, and even though there weren't any lights on in the camper, I could see well enough by the light peeking through the cracks in the window blinds. There was a couch, a small table, some ugly carpeting, and about three different ashtrays at least. Hello? I called out. I stated my name. After a few moments of silence, I concluded that there was no one there. I peered my head further in to get a better look. I saw a tiny kitchen area with a sink, countertop, and cabinets. I was about to pull my head back out when I noticed something. One of the cabinet doors was ajar, and I could see something large and bulky was preventing it from shutting. I stirred at it hard. I then walked out into the woods and found the longest stick I could easily carry, and walked back. What is it? I didn't answer him and carefully extended the stick into the camper. After a few close scrapes on the cabinet door, I managed to knock it open a bit wider. My stomach sank, and my heart started racing. I pulled the stick back and turned to my cousin. What does that look like to you in the cabinet? I pointed. I didn't tell him what I thought it was. I wanted to see if he identified it as the same thing I did at first glance. Roy peered inside and stared for about three seconds. Shit. I don't know what that is. But what does it look like? I insisted. Roy was silent for another few moments, and then jumped back from the window. Holy shit, is that a head? Like a human head? I peered in again. What the thing in the cabinet definitely looked like was a human head lying on its left ear, facing the back of the cabinet. 
so all I could really see was the dark hair and the right ear. I couldn't see the neck very well, as it was still out of sight behind the cabinet door. <laughs> no way that's real. Roy tried to laugh. I wanted to agree with him, but the cold pit in my stomach wasn't letting me. Something about the hair had that disheveled look, and the skin was a clammy white, and there was this rotten meat smell from inside. Well, what else could it be? I remember asking Roy. I wanted him to say something ridiculously obvious that it might have been, but he only shrugged. I picked up the stick again and stuck it through the window for a second time. I wanted to physically poke at it so I could get a better sense of what it was. I leaned in as far as I could and caught the cabinet's edge with the stick and tried to swing it further open. That's when a cold hand grabbed my arm and knocked the stick out of my grip. I only remember the next few moments as a blur. I can recall the feeling of an intense shock and jerking my arm backwards. I caught a glimpse of a bare chest bearded man. I wrenched my arm back as hard as I could and was surprised when he let go of it casually. But the thing that made me most horrified in that moment wasn't seeing the man's face, but catching a glimpse of what appeared to be a second head on a shelf at the far side of the camper over the man's shoulder. I yelled at Roy to run to the horses and we both mounted up and rode out of there as fast as we could. I recall hearing the camper door swing open hard and the sound of a rifle being fired. We didn't look back for several minutes until we were in a familiar area. We then slowed down and changed direction as we made our way back to the house. Roy and I immediately encountered my father coming down the stairs as we sprinted into the house. We told him everything possible decapitated head and all. I'll never forget the look on my father's face. He didn't seem surprised or alarmed, only annoyed. He told us to get the horses back in the barn and that no one was to call the police. He would handle it himself. With our adrenaline still racing, Roy and I returned the horses to the barn and made our way back to the house. My dad made us wait in the living room for our grandfather to come home. And when he did, the four of us sat down at the dining room table and had a long talk. My grandfather looked us both dead in the eye and said if we ever spoke about this to anyone, we would be denied our inheritance of the ranch. We never discussed it again beyond that point, but Roy and I still talked about it plenty. We even rode out there a week later to see if the camper was still there, but it was gone. We followed the wheel marks for over three miles of bush and leaves. We tracked it to a dirt road where we lost the trail. My grandfather died in 2003, and my father recently passed away of heart failure earlier this year. Given our inheritance is secure, I finally decided to write about this experience, because the memory has been haunting me for years. Roy and I speculate that my father and grandfather knew the man that was out there, and even had their permission to be there. But when we stumbled across him and he shot at us, everything changed, and he was driven off of the property. Had my father just blown it off and told us we were crazy, I may have slept better that night, but the fact that we were threatened into silence made me think that the matter was deadly serious, and maybe those heads we saw were real. I feel in my bones that my family helped shelter a dangerous man and potentially cover up his crimes. I feel something may be unearthed one day that will come back to haunt us. My aunt had a near-death experience back in 1996. She and a friend had gone out to the bar one Friday night determined to each find a guy to bring home. They both were single and daring at the time and wanted to try something adventurous. Since this was the 90s, they didn't have cell phones so that they could text each other, so they both came up with visual cues to look out for. If they removed their earrings, that meant they had found a guy that they liked and if they held their hand to the back of their neck in a casual manner, that meant, come save me. Before it was common to have conversations with one eye on your phone, this was how people got themselves out of awkward situations. My aunt told me how she mingled with the crowd for a bit and let a few guys buy her some drinks, before zeroing in on a man who was eyeballing her from across the bar. He gave her a wink, but didn't come over to buy her a drink. She was intrigued by his interest. She crossed the bar and went over to him. She told me that he had a biker jacket on with a gold watch that had a leather band. 
She remembered that detail because her boss had wore the exact same type of watch, and she used it to break the ice. They danced for a few minutes, and upon heading back to the bar, she removed her earrings, deciding that this was the guy she wanted to spend the night with. He said his name was Harrison. They got a table in the corner, and she let him buy her a drink. After a while, she lost track of time. She began to feel a bit sluggish and nauseous. She decided that she had overdone it with the cocktails. She glanced around the bar, but couldn't find her friend anywhere. Feeling shaky on her legs, she excused herself to the restroom, hoping that was where her friend was, but no such luck. She left the bathroom and headed straight for the door, suddenly not feeling up to having company over. She began to hail a cab when Harrison came out of the bar and asked her if she needed a ride home. She had hoped to slip away, afraid she may be sick and make a fool of herself, but she decided to risk it for the sake of getting a ride home and possibly getting his phone number. On the route home, she was feeling a bit better, and she started getting flirty with him. When they parked in her driveway, she invited him in. They went through the front door, and my aunt dropped her keys on the stairs on the way to the living room. They made out on the couch for a few minutes, but suddenly my aunt felt sick to her stomach, and she apologized and told him that he had to go. She said he was very understanding, and hoped that she would feel better soon. They made plans to meet the next Friday night at the same bar. Harrison let himself out, and my aunt locked the door behind him. Feeling disappointed and gross, she went to bed, but couldn't fall asleep, because her head wouldn't stop spinning. Just past midnight, she heard movement from downstairs. She sat up in bed and listened closely. She knew her parents were both still out of state. She had spoken to them on the phone before she left that night. No one else had the key to her house. So for a few moments, she sat frozen, uncertain if she was hearing what she thought she was. Then the noises came again. Not soft noises, like someone trying to be stealthy. It sounded more like someone was rummaging around downstairs. My aunt locked her bedroom door and pressed her ear to the ground. She heard down below cabinets being opened and shut. She grabbed the phone from her room and called the police, and then hid in her closet. In retrospect, she laughs at the absurdity of her situation. Her phone was not wireless so anyone who broke into her room would see the phone cord leading right to her closet. When the operator came online, my aunt started talking a mile a minute, saying that she was sure that there was someone in her house. The operator kept her on the line, and the next 15 minutes felt like 6 hours. During a pause in the conversation, my aunt heard footsteps coming up the stairs, followed by doors squeaking as someone peeked in each room. She then went dead silent as she heard someone pause outside her bedroom door. She didn't even notice the sirens outside until they were in her driveway. The following few minutes were a complete nightmare as she wondered why the cops weren't making entry into the house. The operator informed her that the police were just outside, but couldn't find any indication of a break-in. In a panic, she instructed them to break down the door. Almost immediately, there was a commotion on the stairs and my aunt heard several voices screaming for someone to get down on the ground. After another moment, my aunt crawled out of the closet and went beside the bedroom door until a police officer knocked and told her it was okay to come out. My aunt wrapped herself in a long coat and followed the officer down the stairs and outside the front door, but before she reached it, she glanced over into the living room and saw the plastic shower curtain from her downstairs bathroom spread out across the floor and her father's open toolbox was lying on the ground next to it, along with a couple of knives from the kitchen. She started hyperventilating, and they had to call an ambulance for her. After she recovered, the police let her look at the suspect through the squad car's tinted windows, and she recognized Harrison immediately. It turns out when he left her house, he grabbed her keys off the stairs, and came back later and let himself in. The paramedics reported finding drugs in her system, and it was concluded that he had drugged her at the bar, but perhaps had used the wrong amount because it hadn't knocked her out as quickly or as deeply as he had intended. Harrison turned out to be a fake name, and what was the most strange about him, according to the police, was that he had no criminal record at all. He later died in prison from leukemia. Today, my aunt shares the story willingly every time she's asked about it, 
There's even a running joke in our family not to buy her plastic shower curtains. I would like to start off by saying that if it wasn't for me stumbling upon this channel and getting royally freaked out by all the scary stories, I don't think my children and I would still be here today. A few weeks ago on a Saturday morning, my kids and I were all sitting around the breakfast table enjoying some pancakes. My husband is doing his usual rushing around, getting ready for work because he had overslept yet again. As we were saying our goodbyes, I reminded him that the kids and I were going to the local splash pad for the afternoon. I never used to lock the doors to the backyard because it was fenced in with a locked gate, so I didn't see the need. Today though, I locked it out of paranoia because I had kind of gotten spooked from watching a Unit 522 video the night before. Even though a break-in was highly unlikely, I suddenly didn't feel like tempting fate and challenging a burglar. I got to doing chores around the house when I noticed it was raining outside. Figuring the splash pad was no longer an option, I left the room and tried to find an activity that would keep the kids occupied and we ended up building a couch fort. After a short while, I got up and returned to the laundry room to check the machine. As I was preparing a new load, I noticed our back gate was wide open. I thought it was strange. Even with the wind, the lock should have held. The thought had barely finished forming in my head when my daughter came rushing into the kitchen and said, Mommy, there's a man at the window. He waved at me. Feeling confident that my daughter's imaginative mind was playing tricks on her, I followed her back into the living room. My heart then stopped. On the other side of the window was a very dirty man, wearing a black tattered leather jacket. He had long, oily hair. He wasn't even trying to be discreet, and was staring directly into our house. He had his eyes on my son, who was sitting in the middle of the living room. Hey! What are you doing? Get the hell out of my garden! I shouted at him. He gave me the biggest, most malicious smile. In his right hand, he lifted a very large, bloody kitchen knife. Adrenaline and panic kicked in, and I grabbed my son and my daughter as calmly as I could. I took them upstairs and told them that we were playing a game of hide-and-seek, and that they needed to hide in the wardrobe and stay quiet. My daughter had enough sense to know that we were hiding from the man outside, but I assured her that the man was a friend, and she didn't have to worry. I walked back downstairs. I opened a closet door grabbed the baseball bat and held it over my head, ready to swing at anything. I went back to the living room window where the man had been standing. He was gone, but he left a bloody handprint on the glass. I grabbed my phone and called the police. After explaining the situation, they told me they would have an officer over as soon as possible. The officer arrived in a matter of minutes, and I showed him the bloody handprint on the window. He went outside to investigate. While he was doing that, I got my kids out from my bedroom. I sat them down and let them watch cartoons while I spoke to the officer, and he informed me that there were bloody fingerprints on my back door handle. The guy had been trying to get in. The next few hours were a blur. The officer called somebody out to take samples of the blood. They took my statement and my husband took the rest of the day off to be with us. The officer contacted me and said they had arrested the man who was in the back garden. Apparently, the man had done the exact same thing to another family just two days after it happened to me. The blood on the window had been his own. According to the police, the guy had been recently released from a mental institution and had not been taking his medication. God only knows what he would have done to us if he had managed to get in. Maybe his intention was only to scare us, but maybe it was something far worse. I truly believe that Unit 522's channel saved me and my children that day. If it wasn't for my paranoia due to watching his videos, I think the outcome would have been completely different. So this happened at Christmas a couple years ago, when I was spending the holidays with my parents and little brother along with my cousins, aunts, and uncles. We live in a suburb in Ontario, but we were venturing out into the woods for Christmas, an idea that my parents had for a while. They always loved the idea of being out in a hunting cabin during Christmas with our family. I'm a 22 year old female, but at the time, I was just turning 18 and my little brother Tom was 11. We're really close and we do everything together. We also had a dog, a German Shepherd named Trigger. He's a real softy, but he can be really overprotective, especially of my brother Tom. Anyway, we left our house on Christmas Eve at around 2pm and climbed into our dad's truck filled with all of our stuff and presents for his extended family. 
Tom and I were really excited, winding each other up, and my parents were having friendly conversation as we moved along the road. We had arrived at the village near the cabins we were staying in and caught up with my dad's sister, Billy, along with her husband and three kids. Billy was a bit unsure of where to go from the village to get to the cabins, but my dad helped her out by running down the directions. We soon got back on our way and arrived at the cabins at around 4 p.m. There was a cluster of them sort of spaced out in the woods. Each family had a cabin and there was one where everyone could meet up. It had a pool table, a swimming pool, and all sorts of other stuff. It was the kind of place where we could all just chill together and enjoy each other's company. Anyway, the weather was already really cold when we arrived, and the snow was falling all around us. So as me and my brother unpacked our things into the cabin and settled in for the night, my dad started a fire while my mom made our dinner. It was great. The Christmas decorations were already up, and we played a few board games as the night got darker. My dad, Tom, and I decided before going on the trip that we would all go hunting sometime. So we planned to go the next day. I had been a few times before with my dad, but this was Tom's first time. He was only there to watch us though, as he was still too young to shoot. It reached about 10 p.m., and my brother and I were getting a bit tired, so we decided to head to bed. My dad kept all of his rifles in a bag that was placed under the bed I was sleeping in. He would usually keep them in a locked box, but thought there was no point since we were going hunting the next morning. Tom and I were sharing a room at the end of the cabin, facing a flowing river. The view was beautiful. Tom and I fell asleep with our dog Trigger lying at the bottom of Tom's bed. Now this is when things begin to get creepy. It was about 3 a.m. when I awoke to Trigger growling. I didn't find this unusual because my dad suffers from insomnia, and sometimes when he can't sleep, he sits in our living room at home and watches some TV. Like I said, Trigger is extremely overprotective and growls at any noise he hears. But that's when I noticed that there was no light coming from under my door. My dad never just sits in the dark. I whispered to Trigger, telling him to be quiet as Tom slept, but his growling soon turned to barking which woke Tom up. He asked me what was going on, but I said Trigger must have heard some deer or something outside. After all, we were in the middle of the woods. Suddenly, our bedroom door swung open, and the light switch was turned on. My eyes stung as I tried to focus on whoever was at the door. It was my dad. Were you two laughing just now? He asked, as he turned to look at Tom, his eyes wide, and his face pale. No, I replied as he moved over towards our curtain pulling it back as he looked out into the pitch black wilderness. What are you looking at? Tom asked as our dad closed the curtains again. Nothing. Just go back to sleep. I was kind of creeped out that my dad didn't say anything about what he was doing, but he turned our light off and we tried to fall back asleep. Of course, I couldn't. I was wide awake for the rest of the night, flinching at pretty much every noise I heard. It was about 4.30 a.m. when I finally drifted off, but it must have been moments later I heard strange crunching noises coming from outside our window. I was sure it wasn't some animal. It sounded like footsteps. I had this overwhelming feeling of fear, and I pulled the covers over my face, sweat beginning to cover my forehead. I then heard a faint tapping on our window, which lasted a good few minutes. I was so petrified I couldn't move. Trigger was awake by this point, as I saw his face turn towards the window, his ears pointed and listening intently. The tapping began again, a bit louder this time, causing Trigger to bare his teeth. What happened next was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I know you're in there, little guy. This deep and husky voice whispered as a horrible shiver went down my spine. Why don't you come out here and play with me? Initially, I was filled with rage, the thought that it was bound to be one of my cousins playing a stupid prank on us. So I leaned forward and peeked through the gap in the curtain, ready to give them hell for scaring the shit out of us. But standing there wasn't any of our cousins. It was a creepy old man who was around 60. His hair was matted and his clothes looked dirty and ancient. He was stroking the window with his hands, breathing on it as he spoke. I went into protective mode. I didn't know what else to do, so I grabbed my dad's hunting rifle from under my bed and pulled the curtain back. Get the hell out of here or I'll shoot! 
I felt adrenaline rush through me as the creepy man's eyes widened and the most terrifying smile appeared across his face. Trigger began barking louder than I've ever heard him bark before. My parents obviously heard the commotion and came running into the room, turning the light on. My mom screamed as she saw the old man through the window. Trigger continued barking furiously. My dad yelled at the man, telling him that the police were on their way. But the man just turned around and walked back into the woods. Tom was petrified, but I was just angry. How could some sicko do this? I was extremely glad that I had the rifle. The cops caught the guy just a few minutes later and arrested him. We found out a couple of days later that the man was homeless and living in the woods and was suffering from a lot of mental issues. It scares me to think about what would have happened to my brother if I wasn't there. We spent the remainder of Christmas Day at the cabin, but we stayed in our Aunt Billy's cabin overnight. There was no way that we were sleeping in our own after what happened. We went home the first thing the next morning and never looked back. My dad told me the other day that he knew someone was creeping around when he heard someone laughing and singing outside of the cabin before checking on us, so he intentionally left the rifle under my bed in case I had to use it in self-defense. He did that because he didn't want to scare any of us. He called the cops after he heard the guy laughing outside of his bedroom window. He knew it would take a while for the cops to reach the cabin. Safe to say, that was the scariest moment of my life. So this occurred many years ago, but it will forever stay with me and change my views on allowing my kids to ever have their own separate phone line. It was a few weeks after Christmas, and my parents had gotten me my own personal phone. That was cool back then, before cell phones got big. I had given my friends the number because who wouldn't, right? Anyways, it was around 3 p.m., and I had been sleeping when my phone begins to ring. I thought, who could be calling me this early when we all have to be up for school in the morning? So I answered it, but all I could hear was heavy breathing on the other end. I laughed it off as someone just messing with me and hung up. I tried returning to sleep, but my phone rang again. This time I answered it and said, who is this? Again, I heard nothing but breathing. At this point, I was becoming irritated, and I told them to stop calling me and hung up. I laid down again for about 30 minutes so my phone rang for a third time that morning. I was so mad that I answered it and said, This isn't funny. I'm trying to sleep. I have school in the morning. Stop calling me. This time there was a reply. It was a man's voice, and he laughed and said, <laughs> I can see you. You're very pretty. Why don't you come out and play in the snow with me? I ran to my parents' room and woke up my mom telling her what happened. She woke up my dad and made me tell him what happened as well. My dad then goes into my room and checks the windows and everything, making sure all the locks on the doors were secured, and proceeds to tell me that someone was just playing a sick joke and everything would be fine, and tells me just to unplug my phone from the outlet. So I finally go back to sleep until my mom wakes me up for school. I get up and start getting ready. I open my blinds to my window that overlooks the backyard and noticed on this very frosty morning that there were handprints all over my window. I freak out and yell for my parents. The police came out to take a report and look at the evidence. They went to the backyard and sure enough, there was a set of footprints in the snow that led right up to my window. They had gone from the front of the house to my window, then to the back door, and then back to the front door. The police came to the conclusion that the guy had been trying to get inside. There's always a reason to be afraid.